Hello and welcome. His belief in positive peace has been a source of inspiration for generations of diplomats and politicians looking to work in conflict resolution. This week on 101, meet the man considered to be the father of peace studies, Norwegian professor Johan Galtung. He was born in 1930 in Oslo, Norway, into an established family of physicians tracing its roots back to the Vikings. Exposed to academic excellence, the young Johan Galtung opted to study mathematics, followed by postgraduate studies in sociology, which led him down the as yet unexplored path of peace studies. Over the years, he has established himself as the leading mind and teacher in the field of conflict resolution, keeping him much in demand even into his 80s. Professor, it's great to have a chance to chat with you. My pleasure. You're described as the father of peace studies, and I know you look at peace as something that's active, a positive peace rather than negative. What is the difference? Well, the positive peace is cooperation, harmony. It's a good marriage. Whether two partners are suffering, suffering each other's suffering and enjoying each other's joy. Negative peace is much more modest to avoid violence, to avoid suffering. So you can actually work on both at the same time. You can reduce violence and at the same time try to introduce projects of cooperation. But in general, it's more easy to do it when conflicts are solved and there's not too much violence going around. So these are two tasks. Well, interestingly enough, you've, you've dedicated most of your life to, to promoting the idea of peace. You set up the first institute of its kind, the uh, uh, Peace Research Institute of Oslo in 1959. How was it received at that time? With curiosity and with some jealousy, and of course with uh, various social science disciplines saying that's our turf. The psychologists were strong on that, and particularly the political scientists. <coughs> My intuition was that we have to have a kind of conflictology that cuts across all the levels, and a kind of peace concept that you can apply to marriages, and you can apply to, let us say, relation between North and South, between West and Islam. When you look at how things have changed in, in that sort of half century, uh, it seems peace is, is even more remote for some, some of the conflicts that are taking part. How do you regard how we should have advanced and how far we actually have got when it comes to peace? Very important. I think one example would be the fact that we have 200 states in the world and about 2,000 nations. Nations are cultural groups with a shared history, shared myths, shared language, shared religion and an attachment to some geography. And when they have attachment to the same geography, you have a conflict going on. Now, this was kept under the carpet for a long time. Then came human rights, self-determination. Then came education. People started reading human rights. Then came democracy. They started taking part in decision-making and then discovered that they didn't make headway. So that the pattern we have apart from the 20 nation states with generally just one nation, is that one nation dominates the others. You can imagine then, you have the pressure, democracy, education, human rights from below. It does not meet with any acceptability at all, and then it starts getting violent. So this one is tough. The Tamils in Sri Lanka, as an example. The Chechens in Russia, as an example. The Irish, the Catholic Protestants in Northern Ireland, the Basques in Spain, and you can go around the world, they have been a mediator in all of these, more or less successfully, generally less, but with some optimism for the future. And you do remain active, actually, out there in the field, going and trying to help uh, oh, resolve definitely. issues. Definitely, absolutely. Dialogues with all parties, one-on-one, -on -one. only one party in the room at a time, so that they can express themselves freely. Trying to get at their objectives and then trying to sift between legitimate and illegitimate objectives. I'm not promoting illegitimate objectives. And then comes the difficult part, and that is to make a bridge between legitimate goals. How can they be together? How do you and in the case of nations and states, the general formula is federation. I was wondering, how do you, uh, you know, have an authority that, how do you offer something different that, that, others, that others coming to the table can? That's interesting. You see, <clears throat> the difference between people like me, an NGO mediator, and governmental mediators, is that they have two methods that I don't have, and I'm happy I don't have them. 
So what is, of course, bribing, corruption? If you do as I want, there will be a trade agreement. And the other one is bombing. If you don't do what I want, I'm afraid we have to give you a carpet of bombs instead of a carpet of gold, as somebody once said in Afghanistan. So you see, the people who have those means, the means of punishment and reward, the means of force and economic means, they don't put much work into getting intellectually, morally good solutions. That's the only thing I have to offer. The only thing, and that's the advantage. And that, of course, pushes me towards creativity. Let me take you back to uh, Oslo, 1930, where you were born, essentially between world wars. What, what was it like at that time? You know, I was born into an upper-class family, an old, uh, low-level aristocracy from the Viking period. So from the little western place where we come, you can still find arrows in the ground from the Viking period, the Hardanger Fjord. Whence the ships went out, you see, to take care of some monasteries here and there, and they were honest robbers. When I say honest robbers, they didn't demand that these people should believe in what they were doing. They were just robbing. So they didn't come with a gospel or things of that kind. They were just honest thieves. Now, <clears throat> that's my background. And that family then went on and on and on for nine centuries. Ended up in Oslo. My father was a politician and a medical man. And I was born into a family that was not rich, but uh, was high up in society with that kind of background, the oldest Norwegian nobility family. Noblesse oblige, the idea that you are born, you see, with a silver spoon and you should do something. So my father was deputy mayor of Oslo, sometimes mayor, and uh, did a good job. So you can say the background of coming into a politically minded family, but at the same time a doctor. And my wonderful mother, was a nurse and her father was the director of health in Norway. So when I was born, an uncle sent a cable, a physician has been born. Now that was of course a terrible prediction and I uh, <laughs> was able to escape from that one. Yeah, because yeah. I understand your, your grandfather on your father's side was also a doctor as well. Exactly. Right, so family of doctors and you, you were the radical. I was kind of, I was kind of overloaded, kind of <laughs> overdetermined in a sense, so you see. The but but you use health analogies in peace studies, which is also interesting. That's very important, very important for me. So you see, the basic event from that point of view was when I was debating with myself whether I should become conscientious objector or not to military service. And that was in 1951. And I was at that time, had a scholarship to Finland, and I asked the Library of Helsinki University whether they could produce a book in peace studies for me, because they would like to know more about peace. The arguments against war were clear enough, but the positive side was in favor of peace. And she was searching and said, strangely enough, there doesn't seem to be anything called peace science. But I have some war studies books, if you'd like to have them. <laughs> and then she did what people do in formerly colonial countries. You know, She called the mother country, being Sweden. And I know that you have some, uh, connections, some, some, yeah. some connections. <laughs> and uh, Sweden was also the colonial country for Norway. I won't blame you for that personally. <laughs> now, <laughs> the point about it is that they said peace studies. What kind of ridiculous thing is that? Sweden was an old, quite imperialist, quite expansionist country. You see. So then at the age of 20, I had a feeling that I had something to do in my life. And my father then came as a model. The model was medical science. And the analogy, peace, health, I've been working on quite a lot. It's been, I think, quite fruitful. One, one thought, though. You, you're uh, going off as a sort of, at that time, the nearest thing to a conscientious objector. You ended up six months in prison for it. That yeah. I did. That was because we, conscientious objectors, had a nice little gift from the government, namely six months extra to try to prevent us from being conscientious objectors. And I said, OK, I'll take the six months. I'll do that if you give me service for peace if I can do something for peace. How, how was your character influenced by your mother and father? What do you think you got from their characteristics? Ah, they were such lovely people. And I think also they had a rather model marriage. So I think I got the model of exactly what they said, suffer the suffering of the other and enjoying the joy of the other. Uh, my father's love for me was without limits because you see, if you look at that kind of lineage, that kind of family, oldest son, of eldest son, of eldest son, of eldest son. Now for him, at the age of 49, I guess he was, to produce a son was quite something. 
So um, he became a model character for me. That was a nice thing. He was in concentration camp during the war by the Germans, 14 months, and my mother and I were alone, Nazi occupation. And of course, that night when the police came and took my father, it was a trauma without limits. You were just about 12 years old. Yeah, exactly. How did it uh, alter your views? I mean, this is pre you discovering your sort of inclination towards peace uh, officially, I guess, but how did it uh, impact the way you looked at conflict, the way you looked at these people who came in and basically marched in and, and took away your father? I could have become a militarist, quite obviously. I mean, what took place inside me was never more, never again. This is wrong, wrong, wrong. It shouldn't happen. Nobody has the right to take my beloved father away from me and also me away from my beloved father. Nobody has a right to do that. So the never more was what remained. Professor, I have many more questions for you. We're going to take a short break here. More with Professor Johan Daltung in just a moment. Welcome back. You're watching One on One. We're talking with the father of peace studies, Professor Johan Galtung. Tell me about some of the experiences you had going out in the field, because these were really uh, defining moments in your life. Tell me, first of all, about the Peace Park, a very unique idea. The Peace Park. Well, if you're referring to the Peace Zone up mm. in the Andes, that was uh, basic. Um, you have Peru, Ecuador, and the contested territory, 500 square kilometers. The war started in 41. They had four wars. and. They always had the idea somehow of dividing the territory, that means drawing a border, or Peru wins or Ecuador wins. Now, in my thinking, there are two more categories, neither north and both end. And then they went to both end, mm. and both end comes up kind of automatically when you think that way, you see. So Peru wants it, Ecuador wants it, both end obviously means a binational zone and then you put a natural park into it. You do that. So I said that. In Spanish, zona binacional, parque natural. As a matter of fact, only four words in my experiences when you talk with politicians don't have solutions that take more than four words. <laughs> Actually, talking of uh, languages, uh, it, no one really knows how many you speak. It could be anything between seven and ten. Would you like to confess? <laughs> Neither confirm nor deny. I've learned that from the U.S. Navy. But it must help to be able to communicate in a number of languages when you're out there at the table. You know? And I know each language is a way of looking at the world. It's a discourse in itself. So I can switch from quite a lot to, well, let us say, somewhere between eight and ten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's excellent. No? Um, when, and if I should say one thing, English is not a very good language for mediation because really? it is too, what the French call, placatif, too declaratory. Whereas uh, languages like French, Italian, Spanish, Arabic, Russian, be subjunctive, where you say something without really having said it, it's excellent. Another hopeless language is Japanese, because nothing is declaratory, everything is uncertain. And once in a while you have to state something, once in a while. What was the toughest uh, negotiation you had to go into? What was the toughest situation you were trying to mediate? I thought Sri Lanka was very sad. I was there 34 times, and I have contact at the top on both sides. <coughs> and it was very tough to see how the government was dead set at eliminating the tigers, and how the tigers had only one idea, and that was to prevent them from doing so. They knew they wouldn't win. They were locked into the violence game. And of course, I was dialoguing with them one on one, following the rules about the federation, an asymmetric federation, where the Tamil Elam up there in the northeast, and you can listen, discuss where they're at the borders, would still be a part of Sri Lanka with a lot of autonomy. And um, they had a feeling that it is us or them. And we all know how it ended. And, uh, and I can only say, I'm all the time asking myself, what could I have done better? And you see, the way we work, we try to project an image of a solution on the wall. And the American word compelling is a good word. 
then we contrast that one with what will happen if we just let the things continue. And of course the government said, we will win. No, Mr. Government or Mrs. Government, you will not win. You will have a revenge coming up in five, fifty years. It will come. And it can be very bitter. Well, how do you regard, when you look at something like the Middle East, where it's just been going on and on, the Israeli-Palestinian situation, do you see any hope for that kind of conflict? I do. I started in 1964. And it is, of course, a desperate thing. But you see, I think there is a solution. And the solution that I paint on the wall is a Middle East community, modeled on the European community of 1958. Germany with five more or less neighboring countries. Uh, Benelux, of course, Italy, and the arrogant France. So it would be, if you will, Israel with Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and then <coughs> Syria, Lebanon, Palestine as Benelux, Jordan as somewhat bigger as in Italy, and the arrogant Egypt. Now, arrogant countries have advantages. They have a kind of self-assurance and can be some kind of solid pillar as long as people are willing to bow to them and kowtow to them to some extent. Now, the European community has been a fantastic success. It has accommodated former Nazi Germany. So when I talk about this in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, I know what the argument is. Uh -huh, you're comparing us to Germany. Thank you. So I try to take that argument in advance and say, yes, I am comparing you. I'm not saying you are Nazi, although some are on the borderline. But I am saying you are difficult to digest for the environment. And the Europeans found the formula. It was not easy. The invitation came from France. There must be an invitation one day from some Arab country. Could be Egypt. Here you have the arrogant self-assurance coming up again. But the ground has to be prepared in Israel. They have to be simply through with the Zionist maximalist dream of converting from Nile to the Euphrates to a Jewish territory. That's out. But times have changed and the US has a different role. Then it was perhaps more of that sort of uh, ally to all, but now it seems it may be a bully. Do you see the US as the bully in the, in the playground? I see the US as being tied up ideologically, culturally, in uh, Christianity hyphen Judaism in what we often call Christian Zionism. That's religious, ideological, but it's a more basic type. U.S. and Israel came into being the same way, by wiping out people who lived there, occupying their territory. And I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a U.S., nor am I saying there shouldn't be an Israel. But atrocities were committed. And there are many, many parallels between the Nakba and what happened to the Indians, so-called. So I think there is a kind of feeling that if one of us goes, so does the other. In other words, we're in the same boat, and we have to rely upon each other. Now, this is then weighed against Israel being, if you will, quite a liability for the U.S. 29 vetoes by the U.S. in the Security Council in order to come to the rescue of Israel. It has had a disastrous impact on international law and the whole thing. So sooner or later, it will not be Obama. I think he's much too much in the pocket of the American-Israeli uh, combine. Let's put it that way. Much too much that. But it will come one day. Who are your mentors? Because you, you serve as a role model to so many, and people read your work, and you've set the guidelines for peace studies for, for generations My now. father. <laughs> I come back to him again, not as a mentor in that sense, but as a role model combining theory and practice, you see. Professor of otorhinolaryngology, <laughs> and, and then combining, you know, cutting up some here and there with a knife and injecting some medicine and things of that kind, with being a professor giving lectures and writing articles. So that was my role model. So you see, I have, in a sense, systematically tried to avoid learning from diplomats and from other people in the field. I just have tried to find a new road. And sometimes some people have to do that, you see. It's interesting you talk about conflict and, and, and sort of peace resolution as something that can be applied in the home as well. Have you managed to resolve all your issues using your, your own? Do you preach what you, do you practice what you preach? Try, mm -hmm. try to. I'm not quite sure my family would always agree it has been that successful. But I try to. 
I have four children and I have good relations to all of them. I have uh, two marriages, the first and the last. I won't say the second, <laughs> I said the last. That's optimistic. Twelve years with a Norwegian wonderful lady, forty years with a wonderful Japanese lady. Four children all together, not working too badly. How, how does the family cope with your, your crazy travel schedule? You're still very active on the road. I am, a little bit more than before because the demand is so enormous. And you see, what these people demand is a little glimmer of light in the dark tunnel, often of their own construction. And I find presidents, foreign ministers, prime ministers trying to look macho on television. And when I meet them, they, I've actually had one of them crying in my arms, desperate. So they hope that I can catch some little hole here and there. Well, my wife is very often with me. So, and so often we do the work together. And of course, she feels more comfortable in East Asia where she comes from, so she feels that she's more, if you will, understanding the idiom in a double sense of it. When you, uh, when you drop the, the sort of professor title and the mediating and so on, what do you do in your, your own time? What, what do you allow yourself in terms of hobbies and time off? <laughs> Writing. Writing small dramas for the, um, shall I say, the drawer. Reading a lot, enjoying things, enjoying nature, tourism, and my wife and I, for instance, we can decide that we will now have a trip in the 12th century. So we pick up a map, pick up places from the 12th century and go from one to the other. In other words, the time machine. Europe is wonderful. It's a fantastic continent for those purposes. Professor Galton, how would you like to be remembered? What would you like your legacy to be? Ah, I'll tell you, I am so much into Buddhism that in Buddhism, there is an image of eternal life, which is not known to many people outside Buddhism. It's not that you have a soul that goes up or down, nor is it a secular version, namely a monument, a street called after you, or things of that kind. But it is the sum of the uh, sparks of inspiration you give to others, and they give to others. So there's a cascade. Well, that cascade is my afterlife. Professor, I wish you a long and peaceful life. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thanks indeed.